Okay, I hope everybody can see that. I'm going to leave it in this mode so I can see the slides on the side as well. Yeah, it's work. it works, yeah. Excellent. So I'm going to talk about One Health, antimicrobial resistance, and environmental threats, which is something most people don't talk about. They talk about the transmission from person to person or from animal to person, but I'm going to talk about the transmission primarily from the environment to people. And my company is ACOR. That name, when you hear it, you're going to think of aqueous or water because our inspiration came from novel chemicals that we discovered in the ocean. And I'm also going to talk about biofilm, which maybe you haven't heard about, and fouling. And here we go. So I'm going to talk about the origin of the One Health approach for a very important reason. I was involved in the origin of the One Health, quote unquote, One Health movement. It started really in 1995 when Ebola, a virus, uh, erupted in Africa. And just like you're experiencing in Philippines, you have to contain it. Containment is the number one remedy for a virus. And an antimicrobial resistant bacteria or fungus. So in 1997 to 2000, the, the uh, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, started holding meetings of the Codex Alimentarius. You've probably also never heard of this, but it's an international organization where all of the countries participate to set food safety standards. And they were having big debates because there were outbreaks of another, another horrible thing called BSE or bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Big word. This is not a virus. It is a prion. That is a terrifying term. If you look it up, you'll see there are no cures for prions. They don't behave like viruses and they don't behave like bacteria or fungi. So the remedy for BSE was kill all the, all the uh, cows that had BSE. Then came bird flu, primarily in China, uh, in chicken farms, kill all the chickens. Then came outbreaks of uh, bird flu in pets. So they were asking everybody to kill their puppies and kittens. So we've had all these little outbreaks. Then came in 2002 to 2003, except for Ebola, these were primarily uh, limited to animals, animals spreading to animals. Then came the viruses. SARS, another version of COVID, uh, the bird flu, the swine flu, MERS in the Middle East. And these outbreaks were, outbreaks were remedied by culling the herds, meaning killing every, all the animals and containment. So the WHO convened the FAO and the OIE, which is the Organization for Animal Health, and they agreed to work together and they pledged international cooperation. Here's where I got involved directly. I was working at the US State Department as an economic officer, and I had the pandemic threat portfolio. And what I found is there was no international co cooperation. There was no international surveillance, monitoring, or system to report outbreaks. And I have to say that that lasted until COVID-19. Now, finally, we're beginning to get at least a database where people can share information regarding these terrible viruses. Uh, again, Ebola outbreak 
in 2014 and 2015 in Africa. And again, the remedy was containment. Now, when I was attending meetings of pandemic control at the level of the EU, the US and the UN, what did I hear over and over again? The army has the lead. Doesn't it strike you as odd? It struck me as so odd. Why would the Department of Defense have the lead in controlling pandemic threats? And sadly, the answer was containment and body bags. Yes, there is no cure. And that was a shock to me that our governments had no cures for these horrible diseases, making us all extremely vulnerable. At the 2016 United Nations high level meetings on antimicrobial resistance, they were talking about bacteria and fungi. They were not even talking about viruses. I know this because I was there and I gave a lecture. I was invited to speak at the UN General Assembly high level meetings on AMR and I spoke on biofilm, which is the specialization of my company, One Health, which nobody had heard of, and the need for accessible remedies worldwide. Because unless you have access to cures, what good are, are they? But back in 2016, there were already 700,000 deaths from AMR, antimicrobial resistant bacteria and fungi. There are no cures if it's resistant to antimicrobials. That means disinfectants don't work and antibiotics don't work. They project, the UN projected 10 million deaths in the year 2050. But the Gates Foundation said, that's ridiculous, you could have 50 million deaths within a month of an outbreak. And here we are looking at what a pandemic really means because back in 2016, nobody knew. In 2019, nobody knew. And this is when 5 million antimicrobial resistant infections and over 1 million deaths were already happening from bacteria and fungi. Then comes COVID, a virus, and nobody talks about bacteria or fungi anymore, except ACOR, because we see a big picture and big gap. So here we're, we, my opportunity to work on One Health Things thrills me because I'm going to now expand the horizon. The Centers for Disease Control in April, 2020, reported that 20% of COVID deaths were not from the virus, they were from hospital acquired infections. This is why I say you are all the heroes. All the students working in hospital care are looking at 20% of the COVID deaths. So if we do the math, we see that it's already a gigantic number of, of deaths that I believe are unnecessary. And the other tragedy happen, happening besides pain and suffering and deaths are that the healthcare systems of the, na of the nations of the world cannot support this burden. We have just too many people in hospitals and too many people dying. So what, what it, are antimicrobial resistant bacteria and fungi? Well, one of the reasons is biofilm. This is biofilm. It's a glue-like sticky substance that most bacteria and fungi form first to attach to surfaces, which make them 100 to 1,000 times harder to remove. And then they create a shield. Once the biofilm shield covers the pathogen, no known antibiotic or disinfectant can remove biofilm at non-toxic doses. This means the dose would have to kill the patient. 
So as the biofilm builds this shield, it grows. It is the first resistance response of bacteria and fungi against environmental stresses, which are heat, sterilization, biocides, meaning disinfectants, antibiotics, and immune responses, not only of humans, but also animals and plants. And then biofilm spreads in air, water, and on contact. It is literally everywhere. Biofilm was found on a titanium plate within 30 seconds of sterilization. This is now a crisis for clean rooms and other sterile uh, surgical sites, you, you name it. <clears throat> there is no rapid diagnostic for biofilm. So sure, there are diagnostics that can tell you if it's a bacteria or a fungus or a virus. They can even tell you which type of bacteria or fungus, but there's no rapid diagnostic for biofilm. So a doctor may prescribe antibiotics and it will really never work in the presence of biofilm. Every antimicrobial resistant pathogen, which we're calling superbugs, every single one of them is a biofilm former. So the World Health Organization published a list of the priority pathogens. They're all biofilm formers. The Department of Defense published a list of all the bio threats like anthrax, tularemia, botulism. They're all biofilm formers, all of them. So why aren't people talking more about biofilm? I don't know. Biofilm is the root cause of infection and disease. We've seen that the immune system, biocides and antibiotics are designed to kill free floating bacteria, fungi and viruses, but they cannot remove biofilm. Biofilm is associated with 90% of hospital acquired infections we understand 99% of hospital acquired infections in India, which is a tragedy. And as I mentioned, every bacteria on these lists, CDC and WHO, they're all biofilm formers. So what do we do? We have to understand that biofilm is a major problem it's very difficult to kill and it spreads in air. I mentioned the titanium plate. Well, Legionnaire's disease is being spread in the air conditioners. Candida auris, a deadly fungus, was found in the curtains hanging between the patient's beds. And an outbreak of MRSA was traced to the knot on the tie of the doctor making the rounds. Biofilm on the knot spread. And it spreads in water. So in 2020, the CDC in the US published guidelines for all hospitals to disinfect their plumbing systems and remove sinks from the patient rooms. That's because biofilm uh, Legionella was coming up through the pipes. Uh, Non-tuberculosis mycobacteria is traced to biofilm in shower heads. And these 14 other waterborne pathogens were responsible for millions of illnesses in the United States last year. So this is a growing problem because the bacteria and fungi are getting smart. They're getting resistant. They are superbugs for which there is no cure. So if you're working in a hospital setting, you should take every precaution to protect yourself. And that's why I'm talking in this, this uh, discussion on the environmental vectors of AMR transmission, particularly surfaces. Whereas when people talk about One Health, they talk about animals, they talk about veterinary care, uh, veterinary uh, health, and who's talking about the environment.
this is what they should be talking about because this is the major vector of transmission. So what is ACOR? Well, we're a tiny biotech company. Our founder is a diver. She's a marine and medical microbiologist. And she hypothesized that new medicines are found in the ocean. She saw this scene and said, well, why is it that these surfaces are clean of barnacles, mussels, and algae? And she knew that barnacles, mussels, and algae, which is called fouling, attach to biofilm on surfaces. So she hypothesized that these surfaces must have a natural remedy for the biofilm on the surfaces. And sure enough, she discovered 17 novel marine microbes, little bacteria, that are protecting these surfaces. They're producing hundreds of chemicals, and she was able to isolate one, which we call the novel natural chemical. It's extremely potent to not only kill these antimicrobial resistant superbugs, but they remove bio, it removes biofilm in minutes, and prevents its formation for days. So it's a very big discovery. And we discovered, we uh, developed synthetic analogs. We have 30 novel analogs, which will be new drug candidates. And 25 uh, of the analogs are uh, approved in the United States under the Environmental Protection Agency, not for drugs. That's a very long, approval process that cost millions and millions of dollars, but we were able to achieve a pre EPA approval for water treatments and surface cleaners. So just to give you an idea of Staphylococcus aureus, this isn't even MRSA, this is just regular Staph aureus, which is all over the hospitals, at 48 hours forms a thick biofilm. In the presence of our chemical, it is unable to form biofilm. And this is in the presence of penicillin, but at a thousand dose tolerated by humans. So this works, this is a solution. Then Lonza, a life science company did the validation testing and showed MRSA and a tiny dose of our chemical removed the biofilm. And Lanza said, nothing else known can do this at non-toxic doses. Then they did studies of biofilm prevention and knocked it completely down for 48 hours, which was the duration of the test. <clears throat> but this is the slide that excites me the most. It's a little bit complicated until you see what's going on. Blue is MRSA, orange is Versa. These are the two most resistant strains of Staphylococcus aureus, very common in hospitals. And what you find is methicillin no longer works. So MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Methicillin does not work. You would need such high doses to kill it, kill MRSA and Versa, the vancomycin resistant strain, that you would kill the patient. But in combination with a tiny amount of Acor's chemical, a tiny amount of methicillin kills MRSA. And it also works for gentamicin, which is otherwise an obsolete antibiotic. So it is potentiated to work again. Even penicillin kills the superbugs in combination with our chemical and vancomycin as well. So we did testing for all of the antibiotics and also the biocides, meaning the disinfectants. Because the more you're throwing at these pathogens, the thicker the biofilm and the creation of more resistance. 
So that's what ACOR has achieved. Here's the study of the with biocides. Our chemicals work very well and they're non-toxic. So they can be used everywhere. In uh, medicine, we tested against all of the antimicrobial resistant pathogens. And the National Institutes for Health was so excited that they're sending us now the latest clinical strains. These are the strains in the, from hospitals that are showing new resistance. And what's very alarming is that they're sending us new strains every other month. So the building of new resistance is extremely alarming. And this is not only a, a use in, in new drugs, but medical device coatings. And why don't we just prevent the infections before they happen? And then they're showing that there are surgical site washes, just cleaning surfaces even nasal swabs where MRSA lurks. And then when you put in a respirator, it goes right into the lungs. And in the meantime, using our EPA Toxic Substances Control Act approved green chemicals, green non-toxic chemicals, we have surface cleaners and water treatments and we're offering biofilm and microbial testing because can you believe that the Food and Drug Administration of the United States has no biofilm testing for the drugs in their approval process? So now we're getting into the murky level of, of policy. And I'm not gonna go into why this is happening, but it's a tragedy that the the drug regulators are not testing for biofilm. So new drug candidates get into the, into the process of approval. The manufacturers spend millions of dollars to get there and then to do clinical trials and then they fail because they cannot and never will work in the presence of biofilm. So unfortunately, that tragedy goes on today. So ACOR cannot proceed with medical applications until the regulators accept that biofilm is a major source of infection and disease. Here we have some case studies. So we haven't been idle. We did a many, many projects besides Lonzo. We did big projects on surface cleaners with our US Department of Agriculture. And we had a three-year project with NASA and ACORS, uh, ACOR won prizes for solving the problem of the water contamination used on board the International Space Station. This is a recycled water where the astronauts sweat, urine, the ambient humidity, soapy water from showering is all recycled through a machine and the astronauts drink it over and over and over again. Well, every astronaut was returning to earth, the, an infection. And we were able to solve the problem NASA cannot use anything toxic on board the International Space Station or anywhere in its space program because where are you going to dispose of it? So our can we won prizes for that. And we're now working on uh, with the Department of Energy in solving the problems of biofuel production where biofilm plays a big role. Biofilm is critical. It is every bacteria and fungi, wherever they are found, are biofilm formers today. But for One Health, hopefully someday we will be able to launch our products to end users, save lives. This is the first broad spectrum antimicrobial discovered in over 40 years. 
kills multiple targets simultaneously. And this potentiation to me is fantastic because you'll have low cost and access very quickly because every country of the world has penicillin. So, oops, we have uh, for investors, of course, no one's investing in our product because there's no um, FDA approval process. If we go forth with FDA and the National Institutes for Health is encouraging us to do that. I mean, Dr. Anthony Fauci himself is offering us free preclinical trials for as many new drug candidates as we can give them. It's pretty exciting, but we are still struggling on the health side to get awareness of the problem of bacteria and fungi, biofilm, and the critical need for biofilm testing. We are woman-owned small business. That means we're eligible for US government set-asides. If there's a buyer, they have to buy from women, yay. And I'm happy to see a lot of women in this group. Good for you. And uh, we're encouraging government pull incentives, meaning give us a bonus for our hard work and funding so we can pay for this um, regulatory approval. So here's my email. I am Marilyn Bruno, we're in San Diego. Cynthia Brazil is the founder. She's the marine and medical microbiologist who made the discoveries. And I have optional slides to show you other things, but I think I'm gonna stop here and ask you, oh, let me show you some of this space stuff. It's so cool. So this is the inside of the International Space Station. And you know now what biofilm is and that it builds as a reaction to the uh, environmental stresses like sterilization, heat, uh, immune system, chemicals. <clears throat> well, in space, it grows thicker and faster because of the radiation. And today there are over 130 biofilm forming bacteria and fungi on these surfaces that have been identified. Uh, not only are they causing a threat to astronaut health, but they're causing a threat to the equipment. And this shows that we eliminated the problem in the NASA uh, water system. One dose lasted over 15 months without replenishment. That's a big wow. And this is the actual system. And this is where biofilm was forming the worst in nooks and crannies as it does. This is why most cleaning protocols don't work. In a clean room, they found biofilm contamination. They couldn't figure out what it was from. It was from the screw hole under a table that had biofilm accumulated. Anyway, cheers. Here the astronauts are drinking the water, came out of the recycling system. <laughs> so, it's clean, that's all I can say. It's pretty purified, but we think it's, that's a good way to end. So do jot down my email and let me know if you have any other questions. But certainly Google biofilm and infectious disease or biofilm in wounds or biofilm in on medical devices. There is abundant scholarly articles going back 15, 20 years. This is, I, we didn't invent this. And since you are at the cutting edge of saving lives, you should definitely be aware of this threat and take as extra special precautions for yourself as well. And now I'm opening this up for questions. I'm so happy 
to have this opportunity because you're the ones who are going to change the policy. If you have any influence at all, start talking to the legislators who and say, oh, bacteria and fungi are threats and biofilm is the reason why. So thank you. Do we have questions? Hi, ma'am. I have just a question. Yes. Um, as you've said, your founder is a marine biologist. That's Cynthia. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious that uh, have you ever tried or have you ever looked at the Philippines as an exploratory project as Philippines have many islands? for possible other biofilm resistant organisms? Well, that's what, I, what I, I've always said. If we were smart, we'd put Cynthia underwater because she knows what to look for. She made this discovery in uh, the Caribbean. So it's very likely that the Philippines has great opportunities. Uh, but uh, as I say, she was, is a marine and medical microbiologist. so. Both those skills were brought into play. Uh, I mean, she is the star of all of this. Uh, I just talk about it, but she's the star. And uh, she did all these projects with NASA and everything else. She set them all up. Uh, we, we are a very tiny company and we don't have funding to do a project with Philippines. We would like to or through Zoom, give a course to train people, things like that. But, you know, we're a tiny company. We're working with a lot of brilliant advisors for both the business side and the uh, scientific advisory board side. And as far as I can tell, the real tragedy is that there are so many deaths needlessly because of these, uh, because of this biofilm issue. And it's a policy problem. You know, until COVID, who was preparing for pandemics? You know, it, the impact wasn't even, it wasn't, oh, the awareness of it was conceptual, but it wasn't real until you had your hospitals overflowing. You didn't have enough equipment to handle, you didn't have enough respirators. I mean, it's, it's a total tragedy. So that's our story. Uh, we've been at this since we incorporated in 2006. It's a long time ago. The first 10 or 12 years was research, 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 screening all those chemicals, screening against all the antimicrobial resistant superbugs. But imagine if we had gotten funding back in 2006. And not that we've been totally unsuccessful, but every dime we've raised over the last 12 years, I'd say half of it has paid patent attorneys. You know, it's just a very difficult road because there is so little interest on the part of investors in anti infectives. This is in, we're in the sphere of anti-infectives in medicine. And the investors think the government is gonna pay for all of this development that they don't have to invest. And in fact, the government is treading water, trying to keep ahead of now COVID. It's just taking all the air out of the room. <clears throat> But you'll find out in hospitals how, how dire this is. This is, this is big stuff. It's important, important problems when you see, you know, and many hospitals in the United States don't even report hospital acquired infections because they don't want hospitals to have the liability. But when a patient goes in and comes and dies of pneumonia, that's a hospital acquired infection probably from the respirators, or they have a, a UTI from the catheter. That is a hospital acquired infection. And so it's a very, this whole, this whole area 
is held back because of all of these factors, liability, plain gap in knowledge. Most pharma people never study biofilm. It's a microbiology 101, but they don't study it. Anyway, yes. Yeah, it's a great question. Fortunately, very are these chemicals are non-toxic. <clears throat> they can they are very effective at very low doses. Now I also mentioned that it is the bacteria and fungi have never seen them before. They're novel, so they haven't yet formed resistance it's possible that when they're in use, the bad bugs will figure that out and form thicker biofilm or form resistance. But for now, they're fantastic. Uh, we have nothing but great results in all of these. I mean, we have uh, over 70 chemicals and a lot of, I don't know where I have all the, we've done about 15 pilot projects. This shows the low value, the low doses that have to be used to kill the bacteria and fungi. Our natural chemical works best against these. The synthetic analogs work best against these. These are all deadly, deadly pathogens. And the potentiation tells me, wow, we can just potentiate penicillin and save lives. I mean, the point is in an outbreak, what is your goal? Your goal is containment, very hard to do with uh, bacteria or fungus because they spread in water, food, air, contact. It's not like a virus where you can wear a mask and feel safe. You can't feel safe against these things. That's why I say when you work in a hospital, if you have a little cut and you're touching a contaminated respirator or catheter, you can easily get a superbug infection. So it's, it's not like a virus where the contact uh, transmission is relatively low. It's gotta be from aerosol into your lungs. I don't know what to say. It's a very big, big uh, project. We've been at this a very long time. We're beginning to get some traction. I, I mentioned on the medical side, I don't know if the name Anthony Fauci rings a bell for you, but I met him. He's the head of the National Institutes for Health, National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Diseases. He's doing COVID 99%, but I did give him a presentation. And based on that, he awarded ACOR free trial, all the free preclinical trials. That's worth about, he said, started out for four molecules. That's worth $8 million. We just renegotiated the contract and they want as many chemicals as we can give them. The problem is they need half a kilo quantity so we need to find a chemical partner to work with because we're not chemists and or like $5 million to hire chemists to do the work. So if we're not further advanced, it's my fault. I'm not explaining it right or people have other priorities right now. But the Department of Defense, Army Medical Institute for Infectious Diseases 
also, I said, look what Dr. Fauci is giving us. They said, oh, we'll do that for five of your molecules. That's worth 10 million. So we're beginning to advance to get past this point, but it's very slow. And I'd hate to think you need another pandemic. But right now, if a patient gets a hospital acquired infection, they start throwing uh, cocktails of antimicrobials at them. That's the treatment. And as you know, that uh, debilitates the patient. And you have uh, a high mortality rate. So the, the whole situation is, is not good. And maybe after COVID is over, the UN will step forward again and say, oh, hello, remember the 2016 AMR high level meetings it's about bacteria and fungi people. And, um, but yes, everything we're talking about is needs a lot of testing and approval to get through the pipeline. This, this whole pipeline could cost their test saying a billion dollars to get through these clinical trials. That's why getting to this point would be very good because governments are now beginning to offer bonuses if you can get approvals worth billions that may attract investors back into the picture. To me, it's all politics. This is no longer science. Holding us back is sheer politics. And that's but you know, One Health, how many of you knew, heard of One Health when you were in, in uh, the early days of your studies? It's only very recently that One Health now is, is the term is known and used by uh, a lot of people. But as I say, the, the actual phrase was coined here, somewhere around here and then formalized somewhere around 2002. This should be 2003, that should be a zero. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the presentation. Please ask more questions. I know they'll pop up as you think about this some more. But now you know why I call you heroes. I have a question. Um, can you explain what it would look like for the FDA to change their rules to where they could approve this product? Like, does that require legislation for um, FDA to change their policies or how does that work? No, it's an internal thing of FDA. Uh, the, just to give you an idea, I, I, here's the story. There's, uh, there are people at the FDA acutely aware of the biofilm problem, acutely aware. They've published articles. And even in the CDC, there's, a, there's been a biofilm office for the last 15 or 20 years. And a very brilliant man has published extensively on this. When I was organizing a conference uh, panel for the biotechnology uh, industry organization, I invited both the FDA specialist and the CDC. Both accepted. And then they both said they that their institutions did not allow them to speak. So it's it's like a taboo because in my opinion the fda's role is to uh regulate drugs that kill they do they refuse to regulate biofilm anything that removes biofilm they send products that 
remove biofilm or prevent biofilm to the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, as antimicrobial pesticides. Well, you can't use a pesticide on the human body. So it's kicking you out of the medical applications. So it has nothing to do with science. It has to do with politics. So when I speak to the legislators, <clears throat> which I do, I mean, I spoke at the UN. <clears throat> that was amazing that uh, there were enough people aware of the problem to allow me to speak at the UN. I had a great platform. But uh, the big pharma companies don't want to hear this. And who's going to fight that? So when I speak to legislators, I'm on the committees that got One Health named as we, One Health Awareness Month. One And I worked with the UN on this, the One Health Day, November 3rd. You know, it's great. And it raises awareness. But even among the, the UN uh, One Health uh, concept, no one's talking about environment. They talk about, quote, environment, but they're not saying it's from surfaces, it's from water, it's from food, it's from, you know, salmonella in your food, it's from E. coli in your food. Once you have an antimicrobial resistance strain, I mean, that's how in the Middle Ages you had big big numbers of people dead. And so it's, uh, it's a, even today, a very strange moment where, you know, I, I don't mind being the champion. I don't mind talking about it every opportunity, but you need legislators to say, wait a minute, we need to have this done. And then comes the point is, why hasn't ACOR won the big grants? I mean, aside from Dr. Fauci, who's a visionary and understands pandemic threats, where are the grants? And one granting uh, group said to me, totally seriously, there is, quote, no reimbursement code for biofilm remedies. That means that the hospitals and insurance companies in the United States cannot bill a remedy prescribed by a doctor if it says biofilm on it. I mean, that's to complete nonsense to me. But that's the, that's the state of play today. And what will the state of play be tomorrow? I don't know. But hopefully UNAP, the UN Environmental Group, all of these groups will understand it's a very, it's a much bigger picture than just animals, uh, humans, and whatever environment means to them, especially if you are talking about an outbreak. Serious stuff, huh? Hope we all survive the next 50 years because these bugs are getting smarter. But I, it's been my honor to talk to you. I congratulate you all for, um, for um, be, having the interest, having the motivation, winning your award, any competition. There should be many more competitions. So congratulations to your groups. And if you ever want me to speak again, happy to do it. You are my hope in the future. So thank you sincerely. Thank any, you. Any more questions? Thank you. Don't be shy. Yeah, maybe Sarah have a question or Anyone still have a question? You could directly unmute your micro microphone and 
Thank you. Or send me an email if you have a separate question that you think about later. But do Google biofilm and infectious disease or biofilm hospital acquired infections, you will be shocked at the abundance of literature. Abundance. And you know, they're so still saying the same things that we knew 20 years ago. So yes. Are we? Well, you know, we're trying to survive, so we had to pivot away from medicine because we have found zero support on the medical side, except from the Dr. Fauci and the Department of Defense saying, when you give us half a kilo of the chemicals, we will do the preclinical trials, which is huge. But we, we need money to make these chemicals. We have milligram quantities, you know, it's just silly. And this has held us back now easily five years. Well, we can't find grants, we can't find investors. And until last year when there was a pandemic, no one really understood what, it, what a pandemic threat was. So, and now everyone is obsessed with uh, viruses. And this is not about, we have nothing to do with viruses. This is only bacteria and fungi, so it's tough. But governments are there to supposedly provide public health. And we are the public. So hopefully some enlightened scientists will bring this to the intention of the leaders. And as I said, there's resources in the ocean that unfortunately are being lost as the oceans are being, you know, polluted. So we're lucky we got this far. It's been a saga, a long story. But I, I congratulate you for your hard work and know you're going to be very successful, but you have to be safe. I, do, I wish we had a champion. We're looking for a champion. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Marlin, for your uh, amazing lecture, um, for um, giving us the lessons about the One Health uh, antimicrobial resistance and uh, environmental threats. Um, the, and we are, it's, it is truly an honor for us to have you as our speaker here. And <laughs> yeah, um, in addition, uh, I'd like uh, also to thank you for um, all of the participants here. Um, we're very um, glad to be, uh, to finally be with you guys here. Uh, once again, we would like to thank you for being part of our event because all of you, it went well, and uh, more and more, we want to congratulate, congratulate all of you as the winners. We really appreciate your hard work, and in two, um, yeah, in 12 a.m. Um, noon here, we also have a uh, special meeting with Exco. Here we, ha we have Bailey here. We'll meet again in um, two hours from now. So you could also join the um, special meeting with our um, executive committee in ISOHA. So if you have time, um, just join us. And Gigi would like to say hello to all of um, you guys here. And she said, sorry that she cannot um, join us right now, <laughs> but it's okay, that's fine. Um, so that's all once again, thank you um, for uh, everything, Miss Marley. Thank you for your help uh, putting this together, everybody. Yeah. Great. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. Can, can we have a, a screenshot? A screenshot times. Do you,
can everyone open your camera, please? Your video. Okay. Okay, let me take the screen. Yeah. We just have Dominic, can you uh, please open your camera? Okay, that's great. One, two, three. Okay, one more time. Hold on. Uh, let's wait a minute. Okay, one, one more time. One, two. Three. Okay, nice. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.